Yeah, it is. Changing their hearts for the coming Christ. 
Okay, that was the intent. When one confesses their sin, they don't confess it just because they're going to confess it and then do it again. Uh, sometimes, like in the Catholic Church, that's kind of what people do. They go into the confession, they conf the, the confessional, they confess their sins, and they say, oh, Father, forgive me, I've sinned, blah, 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 I did this, 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 and this. He says, okay, my son, uh, uh, I've absolved your sins, uh, go say four Hail Marys and uh, three Our Fathers, and you're good to go. And he says, all right. And then he goes back and just does the same things over and over. Uh, no, in our case, we confess our sins with the intent of changing our hearts for the coming Christ. And that's what repentance is. Now, when the Pharisees had come to him, it says here that, uh, that they didn't really come for the same reason. They came to see what he was doing. And he says to them, in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, that doesn't sound very friendly. He called them a bunch of vipers, a bunch of poisonous snakes. And uh, what is it about vipers? One of, the, one of the main issues with vipers is that they're kind of sneaky. They, they don't come out and say, I'm a viper, I'm going to bite you. You kind of step on them, you don't even notice it, and they bite you. And that's what the Pharisees were. They were like vipers. They were deadly. They seemed okay, but then they'd strike you and kill you. But, uh, so he calls the generation of vipers because they didn't have any desire to be, uh, to be baptized. They didn't have any desire to repent. They didn't believe they had anything to repent of. But still, he warned them and he said, Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Okay, that's what he called them to do. Bring forth fruits meet for repentance. Now, what does that mean? Well, first, to go a little further to repent, as we saw, it means to change one's mind for the better, to hate your sins. Uh, it means also to change your mind about your sins with the intent that that is going to lead to an active changing in your lifestyle and repenting of your sins, okay? It's a change of mind and a change of heart that leads to a change of life. That's what repentance is. Here again in John verse, uh, uh, 3, verse 8, he says, Bring forth fruits meet for repentance. Now, the bringing forth of fruits meet for repentance is the second part of repentance. Now, in the baptism of John, he encouraged them to repent, which is to change their attitude about their sin, to hate their sin, which is a work of the heart. But now, he says, go further and live that repentance. Put it into action. The word meet means befitting, congruous, or corresponding to a thing. Okay, it means to, uh, again, be fitting or congruous or co corresponding with a thing. Let me kind of explain that a little better. Uh, when Adam, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, the Lord, after the Lord had created Adam and put him in the garden, he created one of each of the animals that he had created before. He created one more of each from the dust of the earth and brought them before Adam with, with, two, uh, with two intents. One for Adam to name each animal, but also to see if there was any that was a suitable mate for him or a suitable companion for him. And I don't believe the Lord expected him to find a suitable mate for those animals. But Adam needed to see himself that they weren't. So he came through, he named each of the animals, and saw that there was no suitable mate. So the Lord put Adam to sleep and took his rib, and from the rib he formed a woman, and he brought the woman to Adam, and Adam saw that now he was a help meet for him. She was a help meet for him. She was a help who was befitting him, or a, a companion who was appropriate for him. So when we look at bringing forth fruits meet for repentance, John means that they are now having repented that they were to live lives that matched the repentance of their heart. The life, the activities, the walk of that person should reflect that change in their hearts that took place at salvation when they repented. So repentance initially is a change of heart, and then we bring forth a life that shows our repentance. Now, I understand this all takes place before Jesus had died for the sin of the world, before he had provided salvation, 
And this repentance did not come with salvation. Rather, again, it was designed to prepare their hearts for the people for when Jesus came, so that when he came and died for them, then they could repent and be saved. That was his point. Uh, he would offer to prepare them to believe on, uh, for eternal life. And because of this, there are some who believe that repentance was necessary only for the Jews, but not for us. Because here, this is a Jewish thing happening, the Jewish baptism and all of this. And they say, no, well, you see, the Jews had to repent, and they had to live the repentance, and they had to believe in order to get saved. Well, no, the Jews got saved the same way we did, but they didn't get saved like anybody else until Christ came and died and rose again. That's when salvation took place. So this repentance is only to prepare them for Christ when he came. It, is, it did not... Uh, it did not get them saved. <clears throat> Excuse me, but there's another school of thought that has changed repentance from a change of heart about sin, which leads to a change of life, and has merely made it a change of one's mind about Jesus. Moving from uh, a, a change from unbelief to belief, and that that is repentance. Uh, a fellow by the name of Jack Hiles, a uh, former IFB preacher, passed away here some years ago. And I'm not, I'm not bringing him up because I think he was a horrible person and wrong about everything. But he was wrong about repentance. And, uh, and he's one of the reasons why the idea of what repentance is has changed widely across the independent fundamental Baptist spectrum. It's because he was a very highly uh, thought of uh, preacher. And by the way, I, and again, I'm not, saying, I'm, I'm not saying a whole lot bad about him. Uh, as well, I turned to become a preacher under his preaching. It was under him that he preached a sermon that got a hold of my heart and caused me to go forth and, and give myself to serve God. So, so this isn't here to beat up on Jack Hiles, but Jack Hiles was wrong about repentance. He said in one of his sermons about repentance, he said, now, if we turn to God's way, which is putting our faith and trust in Jesus, we turn around from going our way to going his way, from unbelief to belief. This is Bible repentance. He's wrong. That is not Bible repentance. That is faith. That is receiving faith. That's all it is. That is not repentance. Repentance, as we've seen, is a change of heart about your sin. It's not just no longer believing in Jesus and then believing in Jesus. It's much more than that. Now, understand these two things work together. Okay, they, they, they work as a team, but they're two separate parts of, of uh, salvation. Uh, in Acts chapter 26 and verses 19 and 20, you can turn there or you can just get on the board there. Acts chapter 26 and verses 19 and 20, we see an example of these two things uh, separated, showing that they're, they're together, but they're two different aspects of salvation. Acts chapter 26 and verse 19, and this is Paul speaking before King Agrippa, and he says, For upon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So number one, we repent. This is the part, the first part. We understand we're sinners, we confess our sins, and we in our heart turn from our sins. Then turn to Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We repent in our heart. We call upon Christ to forgive us of our sin and to save our souls. And then do works meet for repentance or live our repentance. Live it out. These are the three things. Now, the, the, the third part is not part of getting saved. It is part of being saved. Okay, the first two things. The first one happens at salvation. The second thing is salvation. And the third thing is the life after salvation. Three separate things, but they should all be present. So this is why, this brings us to why repentance is important. 
And it's not just important, but vital for the Christian, because repentance must come before one is born again. It must come before we're born again. As we read this passage, we see it again, first repent. In Acts 2, we get a good idea of how this comes about. In Acts chapter 2, we record the great Pentecost sermon when Peter preached to the multitude of Jews. Look at Acts chapter 2, if you would. Acts chapter 2, and again, this is the great Pentecost sermon. Peter preached to the multitude of Jews who come from all over the world, all different languages. This is the time that we see them given the, 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 the gift of tongues to speak all these different languages so that the people could hear the gospel in their language. And he told them here about Jesus Christ. And the result that we see in verse 37 is, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, so they were pricked in their hearts. What that means is when they heard the Spirit anointed preaching that day, they were pricked in their hearts. They were convicted by the Spirit of God, telling them that what they heard was true. And they said, man, what are we going to do? Men and brethren, Peter, what do we do? We get what you're saying. We believe it. What do we do? And he tells them, Repent. First thing he says is, repent. Turn away from it. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, or because your sins have been remitted. Now, baptism wasn't part of getting saved. It was part of being saved. And repentance, they, they, they already believed they needed to repent to follow the Lord, and then show they followed the Lord by, by being baptized. And so, so this is how it works. Repent. You've accepted your sin, the truth of your wickedness. Now change your heart about it and hate it. Hi. Howdy. Hi. Uh, get saved. And so they did. The Bible says in verse 41, they that gladly received his word or believed it and were saved, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. <clears throat> so this first day of preaching on the day of Pentecost brought forth 3,000 born-again Christians. And you know, it was the, the, the same thing about everyone. They had to repent to be saved. They had to change. They had to turn. So repentance is extremely important for us to understand because without repentance... Without acknowledging our sinful state, without acknowledging the fact that we deserve eternity in hell because we've sinned and changing our minds about it and hating it and rejecting it instead of loving it as we have, we cannot be saved. We have a generation of Christians today who don't know anything about repentance. They've never repented. They still hold to their sins, but they think because they said a quick prayer that they're saved. But they've never changed. And they certainly don't bring forth wives meet for repentance. They don't bring forth a life that shows that they never repented. They don't change whatsoever. And so this brings forth a need uh, or a truth that we need to seriously consider. If we are unable or unwilling to honestly look at ourselves and see our sin and see how filthy it is in the eyes of God, how can we repent? And if we don't repent, how can we be saved? And this is a great barrier for many who claim to be saved. Yet they may not be. As well as many who want to be saved but aren't willing because they don't want to see their sin as sin. <clears throat> and there's reasons for that. One of the biggest reasons is because, you know, sin, even though people have, we've always had lost people, in our world, clearly. At one time, many sins were considered disgusting and wrong, even by unsaved people. At one time, society looked down on most sin. Most sin was done kind of quietly and in the background in secret. But today, it's praised. Today, society praises sin. 
Not long back, what was seen as filthy and wrong and sin is now called acceptable. Now they call it a lifestyle. They even call it good and moral. They have begun to call good evil and evil good. We sin willfully before a holy God and we're applauded by society. We're called brave. We're called heroes. Why? Because we stand up against such things as bigotry, against homophobia, and Islamophobia, and transphobia, and all the other phobias that society has invented to make people, one, feel bad about calling sin, sin, but number two, make people comfortable in their sin. And this is the barrier that many say the homosexuals and transsexuals hit when it comes to salvation. To them, they've been raised their whole life, or at least a good portion of their lives, being told that this is just how they are. This is how God created you. You're not in sin. It's okay. You can do this. This is how God made you. He doesn't expect you to change. And so they go to a church, and the pastor tells them it's okay how they are, and they don't need to change, and they say a quick little prayer and say, Jesus, save my soul, amen, and they think they're saved, and now they're happy because they continue to live in their sin, and they've never gotten saved because they refuse to see their sin for what it is. And then when you open up the Bible and show them that it's a sin, they say, you're just wicked, and you're a bigot, and you're just, yeah, this is just old-fashioned stuff, and you don't know what you're talking about. And so they're unwilling to see their sin as sin. See, someone who's truly saved and truly repents, if you bring up to them something in their life that's wrong, and you show them clearly out of the Bible where it's wrong, the difference is they're going to want to get it out of their life. Because they have a, have a change of heart. And God has changed them to not want to do those things which they know are wrong. But these people who you show them and they just get mad and continue to justify themselves and ignore what the Bible clearly says, that's a good example of that they're not saved and they need to get saved. And you know, I point out the homosexual and transsexual, but you know, it's not just that. There's a whole lot of sins people don't want to let go of. People aren't willing <coughs> to remove uh, hatred. We think it's okay to hate some people and not other people. They're Muslims. They're horrible. They're our enemies. We, I hate them. No, the Bible says don't hate them. Love them. Love your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Love them. Pray for them to get saved so they can change from being our enemy to our brethren. We're not supposed to hate them. Cursing. A lot of Christians have problems with cursing. I had a, 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 a supposed Christian throw the F word at me, F U, because he didn't agree with me on a doctrinal issue. And he says, and then he justified himself when I called him on it. Oh, it's okay. I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. Well, yeah, but when you flaunt it, there's a problem with your heart. When we curse and we, and we justify ourselves why we're doing it, instead of saying, you're right, I need to change that and get it out of my life, there's a problem with our heart. Lying. People lie all the time without ever even thinking about it. The Bible says that the liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Drunkenness, smoking, cheating. Uh, here's a crazy one. Being unwilling to work. We are in a society today where millions are unwilling to work. We have some in our own church who are unwilling to work. Now there's a difference between being unable to work and being unwilling to work. And people who are unwilling to work, that's sin. The Bible calls it straight up a sin. We were created to work. From day one in the garden, God gave Adam a job. Your job is to tend and keep the garden. So he had a job. And then when they got kicked out of the garden, he says, you're going to go and you're going to eat your bread by the sweat of your face. You're going to go out and you're going to work the land, you're going to till the land, and it's going to be hard labor. But that wasn't part of, just part of the curse that man had to work. Man had to work before the curse. God expects us to work if we can work. And if we don't work, and if we're not willing to work, <clears throat> and if we're the first or second or third generation on welfare, get off it. And I know that's nobody here, but I'm on video, so I'm telling the people who are watching me, if you're on welfare and you can work, go get a job because you're sitting 
obedient to God. It's your own welfare and you don't need to be. Boasting, pride, ungratefulness, selfishness. These are all sins that one must be willing to repent of if one is to be saved. Now, granted, with repentance and salvation, I don't think we have to remember each and every sin that we've done. Okay, when we get saved, like I said, it wasn't when they went and, and were baptized by John. They sat there and just named off every sin they ever committed. It's impossible. But through your life, as you live, there's certain things you're going to do that the Lord is going to reveal to you, or the Word is going to reveal to you, or the preaching is going to reveal to you, that is wrong. And if you're truly saved and repentant, then you're going to say, yeah, I need to stop doing that. I need to get that out of my life. That's where that changed heart comes in. So over time, we will live. That's where the bringing, uh, bringing forth fruit worthy or meat of repentance. That's what that is. That's living your repentance. And as you find these sins, you get rid of them. You know, and to this day, sometimes some individual sin, some individual act that I did 30 years ago will just suddenly, un 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 for no reason, pop into my head. And I'll be disgusted by it and say, Lord, forgive me for that. Even though I know I've overall been forgiven for it, I still want to repent of that thing because there's a reason it popped into my head. And I need to get out rather than dwelling in it and give it back to God and say, Lord, I repent of that. I'm sorry. I never should have done that thing. I never should have said that. I never should have treated that person that way. Now, again, it doesn't mean I wasn't already saved or, or forgiven of it, but I just, well, I'm just cleaning house. We need to do that sometimes. We just need to clean house. So sometimes those old sins that we have been forgiven for in a general sense will pop up, and we need to do it. And this brings me to this point, that we must be willing to look at ourselves and reflect upon ourselves. We must be willing to and active to reflect on ourselves every day. All we do, uh, because it's a continuous need in our lives. We're human. Because we're human, we're fallen. We're living in fallen flesh, and we're going to have we're going to have things come up. Now we need to be continually looking at our lives. We need to continually self-reflect in the mirror of God's perfect word, which is not that, but it gives us the idea. That's kind of like what we see. Scared themselves look like big monkeys. Like but uh, sometimes repentance may not be so much of repenting of a sin, but leaving behind something the Lord wants you to leave behind. When I chose to become a pastor, the Lord at that point, point began to work me to leave the military. <clears throat> and I had to leave some other things as well. Some things had to be left behind to put me where he wanted me. And I spent quite a few years if you will, repenting of certain things, not because they were wrong, but because the Lord no longer wanted me in those things. And so sometimes the Lord may take us away from something, uh, even sometimes we're fine for a while, but the Lord may want you to change. Well, it may, it may be time for something to be changed in life. When, when Paul got saved, he began for three years, I believe it was, in Damascus with the brethren growing. And then the Lord took him from there and moved him to Antioch. And he worked in Antioch. And he was, he, was, he was working with the Antioch church. And then the Lord pulled him out of there and sent him off to go out and preach. Now, I'm sure when he was there in Antioch in the church, he might have been perfectly happy to stay there. And that was right where the Lord wanted him until the Lord said, now it's time to go out and do this. And then he went out and did that for him. The Lord said, okay, you're done with this. Go back to Antioch. And he went back to Antioch. And the Lord said, okay, you've been here long enough. to go back out and preach the Lord. We don't know what the Lord's going to change in our lives. The Lord, our lives aren't static things. The Lord changes where He wants us sometimes. So the Lord may want us to, may, 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 may tell us to leave family, may tell us to leave our home, our house, our business, our job, sometimes even our country. He might even ask you to leave your church. Not because it's bad, but because He wants you somewhere else. You might be needed in another church. You might be needed in another work. You might be needed to go start a new work. We don't know. But the point is, is that sometimes the Lord moves us and changes us. And if we're not listening to Him and not always looking to ensure that we are where He wants us to be, we may miss it. 
In James chapter 4, you want to look there? James chapter 4, we see a good example of that. So, so our entire lives should be continually revisited. Not that we should always feel like we're in flux and never sure what we're supposed to do, but we should always be prepared if the Lord changes something in our life. James chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So our life should be one of, Lord, where do you want me now? I know it drives Delia crazy sometimes, and she thinks I'm pretty fickle because I'm constantly reaffirming with the Lord, am I supposed to still be preaching here? Now, yes, sometimes it's have a little discouragement, like when not many people show up, but generally, it's because, and, and it's always been the case, I need to always make sure that this is still where God wants me, because God may move me. I don't know. He may leave me here the rest of my life, and I may die in this pulpit in this building. I don't know. I may not. But I need to be prepared should the Lord send me. So we each must be ready. And this is again where self-reflection comes in. We're always praying. We're always asking. Always seeking God's will in where we are. In what we are. In what we're doing. And what we plan to do. Because if we're born again, then we are His to send here or there. Or leave right where we are. And we can't disregard that. So repentance is vital to the believer. It first occurs at salvation, when we change our mind concerning sin, have a change of heart, and begin to, begin to hate the sin that was taking us to hell. And then upon receiving the gift of salvation, we put that to work and bring forth fruit that prove out our repentance. Repentance in action. And every day, every chance, we must consider ourselves in the eyes of God. Where am I? Where do I stand? Is there something that needs to go? Something I need to repent of again? Something I need to confess before my Lord? Something I need to change in my life to follow my Savior? It should never stop. This is the life of a Christian who is led of God. It should be the habit of each of us. If you're holding sins, if you're holding something, refusing to admit it, confess it, let it go. Give it up to your Savior. He loves you. He died for you. He can he'll forgive you. And the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let it go. Give it up. Get right with God. And as we pray this morning, if there's something you need to confess to the Lord, don't confess it to me. I don't need to hear it. I'm not your priest, just your pastor. 